leather also represent massive cruelty. 40 million fur bearers plus uncountable non-target trash animals killed worldwide every year for nothing at all but fashion and appearance. God's dominion or Satan's dominion. Our companion animals. We lavish millions of dollars on our pets, give them the best of attention and love until we grow tired of them. If they become inconvenient or too expensive, then we dispose of them. Some people set them free at campgrounds, rest areas, in forests and towns. Hardly any of these survive. Most die from disease, starvation, and being hit by cars. Those that live eke out a slim living. For every human born in this country, seven cats, seven dogs and cats are born, and there's nowhere for them to go. Now that is a huge improvement from a few decades ago when too many people let their pets breed aimlessly. But pounds are still killing three to four million abandoned dogs and cats every year. These deaths occur when we do not spay and neuter our pets and because we allow animal breeding puppy mills to continue to exist. Are we fulfilling our God-given duty of stewardship toward our most loyal friends? And then there are the many wild animals made into pets that would just as soon not be. Reptiles and parrots and fish can be treated humanely but still be unhappy. Stuck in small tanks or cages with nothing interesting to do, they are far removed from their wild homes. In fact, most tropical fish captured for the pet trade are caught using cyanide. This kills many non-target fish outright and poisons their coral reef home. With so many dogs and cats and other domestic animals dying for lack of a home, do we really need to take healthy animals from their God-given homes in the wild? Experimenting on animals for science. Now in the past, it was taught that the best way to learn about human anatomy and the theory of evolution was to dissect non-human animals. But modern alternatives have made dissection obsolete. Because of dissection, many wild populations of frogs, sharks, salamanders, reptiles, fish, and birds have been slaughtered. We must not devalue life by killing just because it's convenient. Dissection is literally a dead-end education. We should teach the most important lesson of all, the respect for life. One area we need to examine is whether we can cause animal suffering to save human life. Now this is an important subject and needs careful thought. Is experimentation on animals a justified practice? First, we need to note that we experiment all the time on humans to test new products. They are called clinical tests and they involve only volunteers. We must always remember that animals in tests are never volunteers. They have no choice. So we must strive very hard to limit such tests to only the absolutely crucial. We cannot cause their suffering for trivial, repetitive, or useless tests. We must, evaluate, we must evaluate animal research on a case-by-case -case basis to determine its worth. A major area of animal research is cosmetic testing. Dozens of rabbits per test are enclosed in metal boxes with only their heads protruding. Then various substances are poured into their eyes to see how much damage is done. Go into your bathroom or laundry and try to find any product that has not been tested in this way. Unless you have been carefully buying humane products, you will be disappointed. Bleach, hairspray, shampoo, mascara, and detergents are all being used to blind rabbits in pointless tests. The companies that continue these tests say that it is for public safety and because the tests are required by law. That is a lie. No law requires it, and hundreds of companies that never test on animals prove the truth of it. Results of cosmetic tests are only valid on the animal species they were performed on. To help humans, tests would need to show the exact amount of the substance required to injure a human being, which these tests never, ever show. 
Every time we buy a product from a company that tests on animals, we are saying to them, it's all right to do this. You don't need to change. Here's some more money to blind rabbits. Modern alternative tests that do not use animals and are as accurate or better than animal tests are readily available. But companies will not switch until we force them to buy our wallets. Now, the second area that I'll mention is drug testing. Now, it is, is it helpful to test drugs and chemicals on animals to make sure that they are safe? A government study was conducted on every new drug marketed over a 10-year period to find out this very question. The study found that half of the drug, drugs were relabeled or withdrawn entirely because they were found to be more dangerous on people than the animal tests had shown. A pesticide that was proven safe using animal tests was DDT. But the overwhelming evidence of decades has proved how lethal DDT is to animals and the entire food web. Animal research can often be used as a wax nose to prove whatever the researcher wants. Government agencies using animal tests have been proving for years that cigarettes are addictive and harmful. Meanwhile, tobacco-run animal tests have been proving for years that cigarettes are not addictive or harmful. Many such tests prove whatever the researcher wants them to prove. We need to understand that animal research is a faulty method of gathering information that actually costs human lives, since each animal species reacts differently to various tests. About 50 years ago, scientists thought there might be promise in an extract from the bark of the Pacific yew tree in treating cancer. And so they infected healthy animals with cancer and then used the extract to treat them. No result occurred. There was no improvement. The scientists decided the extract was useless and abandoned it. Now, Pacific yew is a small, straggly, understory tree that only grows in the Pacific Northwest. Lumbermen dislike it because it is worthless for timber, and they usually cut and burn it when they cut down other trees. Here is a photo of a yew tree that started growing in 1865, showing how small they stay even after a century of growth. Eventually, scientists decided to try again with the yew extract because they really thought there was promise here. But this time, they used clinical human tests instead of animals. The results were shocking. The extract was extremely effective on certain cancers. In fact, it was the most promising treatment found in ages. But now there was a serious problem. For decades, lumbermen had been wastefully destroying yews as a trash tree. It was hard to find enough trees to provide the extract as a treatment. So two drastic consequences resulted from our faith in animal testing. First, a real treatment of cancer patients was delayed for decades. Second, for all that time, the main source of the treatment was allowed to be foolishly destroyed instead of being used. How many other life-saving drugs have been lost to us in this way? In this U case, our reliance upon animal tests has actually cost human life. We must ask ourselves if animal testing truly saves human life, and if not, then why is it allowed to continue? Reforming our attitude toward animals. We need a new perception of the other animals from that which we have inherited. We lavish attention, time, and money on our cats and dogs. Pets are wonderful. Everyone loves kittens and puppies. But beyond them, things change. Cows and chickens are for eating. That's what God made them for. Ducks and moose are here to be hunted. The only possible purpose of a fish is to be impaled upon a hook. All predators are pure evil and must be eradicated. The only good snake is a dead snake. We think animals are beautiful in pictures and nature films, but let them do anything that causes us the slightest inconvenience and the first solution proposed is to kill them. We marvel at the colors on a butterfly and unthinkingly squash every moth that we can find, when in reality, moths are virtually identical to butterflies. 
for woe unto any animal that doesn't meet with our standard of beauty. Everyone knows all about bats and spiders, octopus and snakes. They are ugly, so they must be bad. The reality is that most people know next to nothing about such animals, and what they do know is 95% nonsense. Test yourself, true or false. Bats fly into people's hair and suck blood from your neck. <laughs> Tarantulas swarm onto people, biting them to death. Snakes leap out of trees to strangle passing people. Octopus pull swimmers down to their death. All of the answers are, of course, false, as are hundreds of other stories that I'm sure we're all familiar with. Stories created hundreds of years ago to scare people are passed on as gospel truth from generation to generation. Until we throw away the myths, we will never appreciate animals for what they really are, living, breathing, feeling creations of God with their own lives and purposes in God's plan. We may not understand that purpose, and it may in fact have nothing directly to do with us, but that in no way negates the importance of it. As an illustration of our thoughtlessness in caring for the animal creation entrusted to our dominion, we need only look to the thousands of animal species currently threatened with extinction. We know of hundreds of species that have been destroyed by human activity. We have no idea how many more are being lost before we even know they exist. And once they are gone, we can never get them back, no matter how much we may want to. Are there any solutions? Now, obviously, what I've been describing being done to the animals is terrible. But what can we really do about it? Now, I'm not asking you to go out and start picketing McDonald's. I'm not asking you to join every animal protection group. What I am asking is that we all examine our own lives to ensure that we eliminate our support of cruelty in all its forms. We often feel helpless to stop wrongs being done, but we actually have more influence than we realize. In this presentation, I have very carefully chosen only those issues that we in this country can alter by our actions. There are three steps that we can all take to save the lives of animals. Number one, never directly cause an animal to die. Hunting and fishing are obvious, but just as deadly are meat and fur. Every time we buy any fur or ivory or meat, we directly cause animals to die. Don't kill that snake. It's not out to get you. There is never any justification to ever kill any non-venomous snake in North America and only in the most unusual and extreme cases should venomous ones be killed. They are vitally important to the ecosystem and only use their venom for two reasons, to catch food and to defend themselves. Leave them alone and they will leave you alone. And I just want to mention this, I mentioned it last year, but I'm going to mention it once more at this point. We are now finding that the snakes that are eating the rodents in our backyard are our best ally in reducing tick populations of anything we have ever found. Because every time a snake eats a rodent, he is now destroying all the ticks on that rodent, and it, those ticks will never reproduce. And so a single medium-sized snake in your backyard will reduce your tick population by about 4,000 ticks per year. And if you kill that snake, you have now boosted your tick population by that same amount. The ticks are trying to crawl up your leg and give you diseases. That's what they want to do. The snake wants no part of you and does not, is not your enemy. You're, the snakes are our allies in getting rid of the real danger of the rodents that spread disease and the ticks and, and chiggers that cause problems in the south in a ways that are increasingly dangerous as they add more and more diseases to the list of tick spread illnesses. And so snakes should not be killed except when there's no choice. And that happens, and I understand that, and I'm not saying we should never kill a venomous snake, but most snakes are not venomous. Only a small percentage are. Memorize the ones that are venomous, and the rest leave alone. And just this week, like I said, I was in the swamp in Mississippi, and I got to see three beautiful cottonmouth snakes swimming in the swamp. And they were on the shoreline, and I enjoyed them very much, and they didn't attack me, and I didn't attack them, and all was well. 
The snakes in America are very mild-mannered. They are not aggressive. I understand this is not true in other places. Africa has some very aggressive species. Asia has some very aggressive species. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about most snakes which are not aggressive, and even in America, the venomous ones are very, very mild-mannered compared to some of the other dangers in other countries. Leave the snakes alone, and they will leave you alone in America. Whole books are available detailing how to deal with backyard animals humanely. Death should never be the first option. Number two, never indirectly cause an animal to die. By buying milk and eggs, cosmetics and toothpastes tested on animals, or animals from a pet store, we allow and fund the suffering and death of animals to continue. When we visit places like marine parks and rodeos that exploit and abuse animals, we make it profitable for them to exist. Most animal abuse exists only because it is profitable. When people stop giving money to the abusers, the suffering and death will stop. And don't say that you're only one person and can't have any impact. A vegetarian saves the lives of hundreds of animals by his food choices. As with spreading the gospel, our task is to help save the individual not to look at the unsaved billions and give up. Number three, educate others of what is going on. Tell your family and friends what you've learned here. Express how much these things bother you. Laboratory experimentation continues only because the majority of people are unaware of what really is happening behind the tightly closed doors of the lab. Abuse thrives on secrecy. If we would adopt these three steps, we would save countless lives. We as individuals can make a difference if we will only make the effort. It is our duty and responsibility as God's caretakers of his creation. And victories are being won every day. Since I first started researching this subject, huge improvements have been made in many areas. Far fewer pets are killed in pounds now. Thanks to the efforts of dedicated activists, rogue Japanese pirates are slaughtering fewer whales around Antarctica. Students now have real alternatives to dissection that they can choose from, and chimpanzees are finally being removed from laboratory prisons. Substitutes are easily available for every meat and dairy product. Many countries are banning cosmetic testing. California just recently passed the first statewide law to ban cosmetic testing, and other states are following, and hopefully America will follow suit. Scientific books have been written proving that fish feel pain. Rattlesnake roundups are being phased out. And some animals in factory farms are being given more room. All of these victories only happened because enough people finally demanded change by their voice and their buying choices. We are not faced with the false choice of helping animals or people, since helping one usually helps both. Change never happens without struggle, but it is happening. In conclusion, as long as we allow or participate in practices that hurt animals, we will forever come short of Christ's admonition in Matthew 5:48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. We cannot have the character of God when we are tainted with cruelty. We are, as followers of Christ, to be an example to the world and universe of his law working in his people's lives. When we fulfill the dominion principle, we will have taken one more step toward that goal. In this presentation, I have shown our responsibility to the animals and the ways in which we have mishandled that responsibility. I very much condensed what could have been said since books have been written on virtually every subject that I have brought up. But it can be summed up further yet in one brief passage by Ellen White. Everything I've talked about today is embraced in it. It is found in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 442 to 443, and is referring to the time after Balaam had beaten his donkey. Balaam had given evidence of the spirit that controlled him by his treatment of his beast. A righteous man regardeth the life of his beast, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Few realize, as they should, the sinfulness of abusing animals or leaving them to suffer from neglect. 
He who made man made the lower animals also, and his tender mercies are over all his works. The animals were created to serve man, but he has no right to cause them pain by harsh treatment or cruel exaction. It is because of man's sin that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth together. Suffering and death were thus entailed, not only upon the human race, but upon the animals. Surely then it becomes man to seek to lighten, instead of increasing, the weight of suffering which his transgression has brought upon God's creatures. He who will abuse animals, because he has them in his power, is both a coward and a tyrant. A disposition to cause pain, whether to our fellow men or to the brute creation, is satanic. Many do not realize that their cruelty will ever be known, because the poor dumb animals cannot reveal it. But could the eyes of these men be opened, as were those of Balaam, they would see an angel of God standing as a witness to testify against them in the courts above. A record goes up to heaven, and a day is coming when judgment will be pronounced against those who abuse God's creatures. I can add nothing to that except to ask that we please allow that day to come soon. For the animals' lives and the vindication of God's character is in our hands. Let us remember the words in Isaiah 11, verse 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. As we finish up here, I'm going to put this on the screen for you to take a look at. These are resources that you can use to find cruelty-free uh, places. This is a number of websites that list those companies which do not test on animals. And then you can go from there. There is also an app that you can get um, in either for uh, uh, Google or uh, iPhone that uh, if you type in cruelty free, you can find various apps that will actually allow you to scan the barcode of various products and it will tell you if it is tested on animals or not. And so these are things that you can do that are very easy and useful to find what is cruel and what is not. As we finish up with our program here, we went a little later due to uh, um, inclement uh, weather and that sort of thing, so we're a little bit past sundown, but not too bad. At the back of our uh, program back here, we have the uh, tables in which we have all of our resources put up. And uh, so please take a look at what we have. We have a number of different things available for sale, but we also are going to be giving you things as well. To start with, we are going to give you a free copy of my book of the same title as what we just did, Animals, Ethics, and Christianity. It, the first half of this book basically covers the sermon that we just uh, looked at. Um, the second half of this book is brand new from what you have heard tonight and goes through a lot of the different gray areas. What I've talked to you tonight is the black and white issues that really have no uh, possibility of being okay. In this, we talk about some of the areas that we need to look at and figure out what's right, about dealing with backyard pests that are eating our food, and dealing with leather, dealing with the various things that sometimes aren't as clear-cut as what we've been looking at here tonight. So please take a look at this book, and uh, it's our free gift to you for staying until the sundown, and uh, it'll be back there with our table. Make sure you get it. Also on the table is, uh, and a side table, I don't know exactly how it's laid out, but is a, uh, a bunch of leaflets on various topics. And these are free to take. They cover a bunch of different things I talked about tonight, as well as the things I did not talk about. And I, they're from a variety of groups, and please understand I'm not promoting any of the groups as better or worse than anything else. There's groups you might not like, there's groups you might like. I'm not trying to get involved in any of that. I'm just putting out information. They put out good information on various topics. A lot of what we talked about plus more and so please use those as a resource share them read them um, don't just take them home and, and throw them in the trash spread them to your neighbors do something with them because this is something that we all can do to share information amongst each other we also have little um, uh, wallet sized uh, um, helpers to find humane pr uh, food products and different things like that so there's quite a bit of material that we are uh, allowing you to have as free gifts to be able to use and that will help you follow up from what we have done here tonight. 
All of our materials are available on our, like we have had before. As you remember, we have a number of different DVDs that uh, cover our nature presentations. This was our first year's presentation on uh, the impossibility of evolution. This was last year's presentation on the miracles of God's design. We have a number of different things for kids, and we have a number of different ones for adults. The one that you have seen tonight is... Uh, Oh, I want to mention this one. God's Wonders Down Under. Our trip to Australia, we spent two months down there, and this is the product of all of our findings of amazing animals that are so different from anything we have here in America. This is our biggest, most uh, fanciest DVD we have put out yet. The one you have seen tonight is this one, Animals, Ethics, and Christianity. This covers exactly the same sermon you have seen tonight with the same pictures, and of course it is exactly the same as what the book is as well. So please take a look at what is available in order to be able to find something that you can use and share this information with those around you. And uh, we thank you for coming to this meeting, and it's been an adventurous one, but uh, we're glad that you were able to be here and uh, look at an area that we don't cover nearly as often as we should in the Adventist church. I'm going to close with prayer as we dismiss. Father in heaven, we've looked at your nature, and we've looked, taken a hard look at some of the ways that we have done things that we should not have done as your representatives here on earth. Help us to take what we have learned and... Be more representative of your character so that we can honestly and clearly say that we are not the cause of cruelty. Help us to be your witnesses to the watching universe, that we don't want any part of Satan's way, that we want only your pure way as far as we can in this world until we have the perfect world coming up when there will be no death and no cruelty and no suffering of any kind. In Jesus' name, amen.